Hello everyone, I'm Congressman Darren Soto, and I'm here with one of our famous Tuskegee Airmen, Mr. Richard Hall of Winter Park and Maitland here in Central Florida. And we're going to be doing an interview for our Library of Congress series in World War II. First of all, Mr. Hall, I just want to thank you for taking the time, thank you for your service, and what you've done to help make this country a safe and wonderful place. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it too. We want to start out with uh, just a little background. So you initially came to Winter Park as a young boy, is that correct? Yes, I was five months old. And my folks brought me to Winter Park. And then you grew up around here and went to what school in Central Florida? I went to Winter Park Elementary first in Winter Park. And then I went to Hungerford, the Robert Hungerford uh, Boarding School, which is located in Eatonville, Florida. Sure. Yeah. And what was the year that you entered into hung Hungerford about? Uh, let's say 1938. And uh, did you? Uh, participate in any particular sports or clubs or anything of that nature? Uh, yes, I played football, basketball, and I ran track. So you were quite the athlete. That's, that's what my legs were going now. <laughs> well, you still seem to be moving around just fine, <laughs> Mr. Hall. And then from there you uh, went on to additional education, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's graduated from Hungerford. Then I received a four-year athletic scholarship at Xavier University in New Orleans. Wonderful, and how was your experience at Xavier? Well, Xavier being a Catholic school, um, I first learned uh, the Hail Marys and uh, Apostle Creed. And it was pretty strict, huh? Very strict. But at some point your college education got cut short, right? You were uh, drafted, is that correct? Well, what happened uh, when the draft was, my first month of college, the draft was 21 to 31. Uh, the same year that I went to college, the draft went from 18 to 45. And I just turned 18. So, the Catholic sister said, now Mr. Hall, if you join the reserves, then we'll keep you protected from the draft. Well, it sounds kind of good to me. So I joined the reserves. Well, I was in the reserves by a year and I got called active duty. And what were you feeling at that point when you got the call <laughs> to active duty? Well, I want to stay in school, but uh, I had no other choice. And where did you end up uh, going to boot camp? Well, let's see. <coughs> went to Aberdeen, Maryland, Proving Ground first. And what was that like? Well, it was terrible. <laughs> uh, you had to go on a raffle range and qualify with a raffle. And uh, the range is off the coast of uh, Delaware. And it was cold. No. And we slept in pup tents. And the idea is you would stay there until you qualify. And so using that M1 raffle, um, most kids, uh, their shoulders were knocked out of place because it kicked. So Sure. So I put a pad on my shoulder. So I, found, I, I qualified the first day. You qualified the first day? Yes. How long did some of your peers take to qualify? Oh, a couple of weeks. So did you share with them about having the pad on your shoulder as a big help? Oh, of course. Of course. And from there, after you qualified, what happened next? As of then, we uh, got transferred to. Uh, BLF was based in California. I don't know if I remember my additional training. And did they just tell you you were going to go to Air Force training or did you get to pick that? No. In those days, you didn't pick anything. <laughs> of course. So, had you ever had any experience with aircraft before you got picked to go out to California? No. So, what did you think when you knew you were going to be working with airplanes then? Well, I was happy. Because I figured that uh, it would always be inside of a hangar, be warm. Sure. At that time, that's what I thought, but I found out different. Sure. 
Did you have any mechanical experience before that time? Only with cars. My dad uh, always tanked with engines, and I'd watch him. You know, I knew what valves were, bearing, and piston heads and stuff. Yeah. Sure. And so when you got to California, did you go through a training program, or well, what happened every, every at that point? Everything's training. And uh, did you find uh, airplanes to be a little more complicated than cars, or did you pick it up quickly? Yeah, I picked it up very quickly because at that time, see the P40, uh, that engine was just like a car, only has 12 cylinders. So only difference. And at this point, when you're out in California, was the uh, Tuskegee Airmen program already in existence, or was that still? going to happen in the future? Something in the future, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I just want Sure. And so, how long did you spend out in California? Yeah, of course, it was about three months, I guess. Yeah. And, and that was around 1940? Maybe 42. 42. 42. 42. It was around the season, 43. And then... So from California, you ended up going overseas then? Yeah. And where did you end up going from there? Oh, um, a place called uh, Cheru, France. And what was the travel like going from California <laughs> over to France? Well, to me it was exciting because I never traveled that long distance before. Sure. And uh, were you and your peers scared, excited? I was really excited, I think. At that time, and I was too young to be afraid of this. Sure. And what was your first impression of France when you arrived? When you arrived there, the language. <laughs> but I learned to speak a little French. You did. Yeah. And uh, where were you stationed when you were in France? Was there a particular uh, base? Cheru. Cheru. Cheru, France. It's just outside of Paris. It's just what's the no, south of Paris. Do you remember how far away from the front you all were? Well, at that time, see, the Germans, uh, well, see, the Germans were still in northern part of France at that time, see, and also <laughs> in Germany. So we were, Chateau was only about, that's about to walk from me. Uh, I have to look at the maps. So you were pretty close. Yeah. And what, uh, Work did you do at Cheru? Yeah, air fire maintenance. Try to keep them flying. They come back all banged up, you know. We try to patch the hole or <laughs> get everybody online, you know. So, what type of banged up type of issues would you have to fix on some of these planes? Well, most of the time, if you got hit in the engine, you have to slow your engine, you could probably pull that plug out and patch it. But sometimes it's so bad you couldn't, you might roll. It's the whole thing. And so you'd have to figure out which planes were yeah. fixable and which ones. Oh, yeah. You had an LCP. Uh, this aircraft in, in our commission. So we had a board in operation. They show by serial number every morning what number the aircraft was in. By serial number, was in commission or out of commission. And if it was out of commission, why? You know, and then estimated time of it. And uh, what type of planes did you normally work with when you were there? P-40. So it was at P-40, that, that P-40 throughout the most of the war? Well, we got the P-47 P, uh, P, uh, later on. And it supported a much faster airplane. And they had uh, these round, with the cylinders on like this thing. The P-40 is just like a car, only had 12 cylinders. Sure, and so that gave you a familiarity. What <coughs> were the pilots like that you engaged with, and how did they uh, interact with a lot of the engineers and other repairmen? <laughs> well, I'm sure this thing's going to bring it back home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. So there was a close relationship oh, between course, you all. Course, yeah. And um, do you recall any particular uh, story of of barely getting back to the air the airfield that you that sticks in your memory. Mm. Like maybe had one came back and he pretty much shut up. 
And so opposition to them to the land. And uh, it was a lake not too far. Put it down in that lake and then we'll cross the sea around here. And then <clears throat> at this point, did they start bringing over some of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen over? Were, were they finished training? At, at what point did that happen in the war? But I'm gonna see, they were already overseas when I came in. My so you got there and they were already there? Yeah. Right. And what was your impression of some of the pilots you worked with uh, from Tuskegee? I thought they were outstanding. Uh, they had a lot of kills and uh, it's pretty good record. And was there a, a point of pride with uh, these being the first African Americans in a uh, in a air unit serving in our country? Oh yes, very proud. And w what did it feel like having grow up in Florida and, and now you're in France and you all are flying these amazing aircraft and fixing everything? Did it open your eyes a lot more to the to the world and to I mean what was the what was that feeling like? Oh well, yeah. it did. Uh, in my case, you see, after the war was over, I was assigned to a mobile training unit because she knew that force was going on, and it was a set up of a bunch of detachments. Each detachment uh, had crew members on it that represented every system in the airplane. I think what happened, somebody in Washington said, hey, you know, we got a lot of old airplanes. They're parked down in Texas, and one ship, the one ship was dry, figured it was the last one I ever had. My son parked in Arizona. We made a lot of airplanes during World War II. Sure. So after the war was over, what did they decide to do? Park them down in Texas and Arizona. One ship, the one ship. Some with the ties on, and so on. So, I guess I don't know uh, what's been. I guess in the first fifty or the fifties, somebody in Washington says, "What, what should we do to the war airplane?" Uh, but you know, we got a lot of friends. We could use these. Sure. At that time, everybody was our friend. Sure. We had no enemies other than the Germans and the <laughs> Japanese. Sure. So they formed these mobile training detachments. And that job was to teach the people how to maintain them. Then the pilots would go in and teach them how to fly them. And, so. and I was in all of I had no idea so many countries in South America. There are I many. I had no idea, you know. <laughs> but growing up in Florida, that's from Mexico to South America. And uh, I'm sure <laughs> from all the wartime training, you had a lot of things to teach them. How long were you in France for? Oh, I, I was in France about less than a year just before the war was over. Yeah. And do you remember any particular uh, pilots, Tuskegee Airmen pilots, that stuck out in your mind for one way or another that you interacted with? Well, there's two or three. McGee was one. <laughs> How was McGee like? <laughs> well, he, well he, he, he was a good pilot. We had some other problems too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure some of, the, John knows about those. some of these folks were probably very proud. They were making history and defending our country, oh, right? Oh yeah, oh definitely. What were some of the other pilots you recall? Well, let's see. Uh, one friend of mine, uh, he was shot down and taken as a Prisoner of war. Oh my gosh. Yeah. My career uh, was in there. Yeah. And I think I only had a few missions. And they shot down over Germany. And so he survived. In fact, when I came up for retirement, uh, he was waiting for the state of Ohio. I called him one day and said, Hall, uh, I'm staying coming up for retirement. I said, Yes. So what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to Florida. I've been trying to get to Florida for the last 30 years. <laughs> and finally got back. <laughs> no, he said, oh, come on down and take a day down. And do the job with the state. You're too young to go down to Florida, get fat, and die early. <laughs> well, we know neither of those things happen. 
and so that, that's what it is. And what was your feeling when the war was over with Germany? What were you? Fi- how did how did you find out? What were you feeling at the time? Then was just just a little bit off of my mind. No, but I was concerned about getting back to see my parents, my family. No. And so, when the war ends, what happened? Ne- what happens next? You end up going back to the United States. Oh yeah, I came back to the United States. And did you feel like changed at all, having lived in Europe and gone to California? <laughs> what was that experience like coming back to the stateside after being in France? Well, I didn't want to go back to France, and I didn't want to go back, <laughs> back to California. I want to come to Florida. Sure. Yeah. And then from there, you ended up working where at in the States when you got back? Well, when I came back, uh, I stayed in the service. Sure. Yeah. Because I tried to get back to Xavier, and uh, they said, well, we'll put you on the list, sir. But me being non-Catholic, I figured that uh, I wouldn't have a high priority on that list. So So it was a major sacrifice for you, uh, having gone to Xavier on a scholarship for athletics and then getting drafted and going to serve our country in a historic fashion, but coming back and not having that opportunity. Well, I survived. Of course. <laughs> and what did you end up doing back in the States uh, f- with the airmen after that? Oh, well, when I retired in the Air Force, uh, I'll tell you about uh, McCray, who worked for the state. In fact, he was deputy, you know, like six or seven, uh, member of the cabinet and so on. Incredible. He, so he called one day and says, uh, what are we going to do? And I says, I'm going to Florida. And I said, oh, no. He's going to go down to Florida and get fat and die. Because <laughs> <laughs> just be sitting around. And so uh, he gave me a job with State of Ohio. He said, to take it down. Sure. So they gave me a state credit card and a state car. And I was in charge of quality control. That's in wonderful. State of Ohio, yeah. And you must have had a wealth of experience by then. Oh, yeah. yeah. And just to discuss a little bit about how did you find yourself going to Korea next after the after World War II had concluded? I'm going to tell you what, I, I was on Oakland Mountain at the time, and my wife was traveling on the 1st of June, on my wife and baby. Oh my gosh. 1st of June, so the colonel came by, Colonel Buckman came by, I got a house, I waiting on my wife to travel, my plant flowers in the yard. They made me some bamboo furniture and so sort on. Of and so the current world came by one day and said, Oh, when the last time did you qualify on the rifle range? And I said, Oh, we qualified together. You know, I wasn't already to ask. He knew when I qualified. Sure. You know? uh, he says, uh, Come on, get in the Jeep. He had, he had Jeep also. We go to the rifle range and drive a weapon, a couple of weapons and fire off a few. And while I was over there, he said, you know, little country up north is decided to fight among themselves. He said, what country? He said, Korea. Well, I know Korea was part of the north, you know, I'm on Okinawa, see? Sure. Uh, and I said, come on, you know, what the, my wax going on the 1st of June, the 1st of July. He said, well, the orders have been canceled, so she knew about the war before I did. <laughs> I'm in the theater. <laughs> yeah. and and so, what year was that where you were in Okinawa? I was in 49, between the war was around 50. And so then, uh, that was about the time, how long did you stay in Okinawa before you left for Korea? I stayed there in September, I don't know, February, that next year in August. Uh, no, it was in, yeah, no, it was September. Sure. Because we had one some uniforms on down Okinawa. It's hot. Just sure. like Florida. It was Korea. About to freeze. I did a stupid thing in Korea. Oh yeah, what was that? Well see it was the comment said find some place for your platoon, see. So I found an old schoolhouse. It didn't have no top in it, see. But it had a flatbed stove in the middle of it. And we had someone Oh, sure. So the guys 
start pulling off the see the walls off the side of the building and the bill of fire is oh no top. Good target for anybody flying over it now. The colonel had told us that they come over at least once a night and drop one bomb. They never hit nothing, see? <laughs> so I think they took this word out of the window. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and what was your first impression of Korea when you got there? Try to survive. That's sure. At that time, that's the only thing that was on my mind back to one Sure. Uh, and what was your rank by that time? That's a matter of seven. Yeah. And how many folks were in your unit? Yeah. First five. <laughs> yeah. About three thousand, I think it's all good. So it was quite a, yeah. a a large group yeah. of folks. But I just had one I just had one squadron. And how, how many first people were in your squadron? And how many people were in your squadron? Well they varied. Let's see. Twelve to the squad, three times twelve be three. About four six about fifty. Four to fifty. And by then, had uh, the army been integrated, or was it yeah, still? Yeah, really integrated at that time. At, at what point was that around that that you? The, oh, see, the when it broke up, just the AM, that's when they integrated. Sure. So, and that yeah. was around when you were in Okinawa, or a little oh, before no, that. No, that was happened before. Okay. And because see, uh, they integrated in '49. Sure. I mean, that's when the law came out. Of course. Now, it took the arm a little while to do it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but the Air Force did it right away. So you're in Korea in charge of a, uh, in, in integrated group of um, men. Yeah. Um, back did, away. Were, was that, did everybody respect you right away, or were there difficulties? Well, it's the way you carry yourself around the world. Sure. So you demand this respect. Sure. Then you get it. You know. I'm sure being a veteran. And you do it with a smile. Sure, of course. <laughs> and I'm sure being a veteran of, of one major war already, there were probably some people who were pretty new there, right? Oh. Yeah. And it's what type of. coming in, you know. Well, these guys <laughs> in my squadron all had four or five months. And, so. and were you all still fixing airplanes over there? Yeah. Or, and uh, what planes were you all working with in Korea? Oh, we had a night fighter. Uh, and keep uh, B-25. Yeah. And did you see those planes take as much fire as in World War II or was it a little different? I think uh, uh, Korea, they can't compare Korea, I think, with World War II. Sure. Yeah. It's a difference. Uh, that's just a little firefight, they call it. Korea. Sure. Yeah. So, it was a, for, so for you, it was a much smaller scale than what you had seen in right, France. Right. Uh, was there, did the planes take a lot less fire then than they did in World War II? I would, I would say that, yeah, it would be less in Korea then. Because in Germany, right there, <laughs> they had, uh, so I'm thinking that one airplane. See, when you get young, like, when your memory gets really short. Well, we're, <laughs> you've been doing a great job, Mr. Uh -huh. Hall. Uh, I realize a lot of this stuff has taken place 50, 60 plus years ago, 70 years like ago. 70 so years ago. It, 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 it feels like yesterday hearing you talk about it now. And uh, how long were you in Korea for? Well, let's see. Uh, from September. Oh, yeah. But I ran out of Korea. You know about that, right? Sure. You know, well, I was in part of that outfit came back to do time. So you were there when we had to leave and then we had to come back. Right. But I wouldn't know when they came <coughs> back. I, I had a choice. I had to have my, I had so many points. My wife and daughter could come to Japan or I could go home. Now I'm still flying up to Korea every other day. So. And I thought about it. No, I'm going home. So sure. <laughs> with that choice. <laughs> and I'm sure that was what your wife's preference was, of right? Of course, of course. And so when you came back, is that when you found yourself in Ohio, or did you come back to Florida at that time? Well, I never got to Florida until I retired. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I figured. But I'm <laughs> asking. Vacation. So what state were you at next? Oh, the next back? state. Listen, when I left Korea, 
I went to a nice little place. Rampos, North Dakota. <laughs> a nice, nice and sunny, warm, warm spot, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what did I kept saying, I'm from Florida. <laughs> and, and what did they have you doing in Grand Falls? Same thing, aircraft maintenance. And what were the types of planes that were over there? Well, let's see what we have. We had a lot of little everything. Also, we have missiles, see, in, in, in North Dakota, on, on, on the ground missiles. And you know, all pointed toward Russia. Sure. So they those were classified at one time, but not anymore. Yes, and we won't make you talk too much about it. But I'm mm -hmm. sure you were uh, in. Did you already kind of feel at that time that there was a Cold War rivalry starting between Russia and the United States? Yeah. You know, we would be real there for most civilians. You know what I'm sure. Yeah. And. You might have recalled when, after the war ended in Germany, the United States dropped the, the two nuclear bombs on Japan. Mm -hmm. What was that like when you heard about that? That's terrible. Because once I was stationed, I was stationed in Japan, I mean, around South of Korea, I had a, a secretary, and she had a burnt on the side of her face. And so she was 20 miles from ground zero when they dropped the bomb. Sure. And so they hired people who were affected by that, by the bomb. They got, they got uh, priority. Sure. You know. And so the secretary that I had, she decided her face was just strong. It's a long way from ground zero, so that's quite a bomb. Sure. Yeah. And I'm sure you interacted sometimes with Marines and, and Navy men who might have had to continue to fight if that were in the Pacific and, and well, what was sort of the interaction when you when you met with some of them in Korea and at the, after World War Two? After World War Two, well, the only ones I met was the ones took the air. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, after you came back to uh, to North Dakota, how long were you there for? Let's see. How long was about? Uh, about a year, one season. Sure. <laughs> uh, one season. Sure. And then where did they where did they send you to next? Well, from North Dakota, I was sent back to Columbus, Ohio. Be a, uh, uh, they changed the name of that base now. Uh, and that was Mr. McCrory who brought you back there. No, he was already there. Sure. Yeah. And, and uh, I found out he was there then. He found where I was, and that's when he offered me a job. What was it like when you got to see him for the first time since probably when he took off before he was taken care of here? Um, because I had 30 of the did, see, so I knew he was a POW. Sure. So, and he is at least alive. So when you meet him, what do you guys talk about? talk about everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. I'm sure. I talk about his family. I talk about my family because we are both singles. So. Sure. Yeah. And did you talk about his experience in Germany, or was that something that you just wouldn't really talk about? Didn't talk about because I know yeah. he, had, he had a rough time. Sure. Because yeah. he uh, <coughs> he must have been in that prison camp for about two years, I guess. Sure. But he's the type of guy that survives, survives. Of course. Yeah. Of course, and yeah. um, it, it appears that you know our military recognized that by promoting him after that. Yeah. And then, how long did you stay in Ohio for? Well, the second time? Yeah. Oh, uh, until we had a job at State of Ohio. Sure. Yeah. And uh, we had talked briefly earlier uh, that you were also involved in the Vietnam War. What was your role in that? Aircraft maintenance. Yeah. Did you go over to Vietnam? Yeah. And when did you end up going over? Well, let's see. <coughs> I went over to Vietnam. What was it early 60s or mid 60s? Let's see, 62, 63. So you were there early. Yeah. And. So I was stationed at Thompson River. And where were you stationed at? At Thompson River. And. This side of Saigon. So. Sure. Yeah. And what was that like yeah. being over in Saigon? Well, the first day that I got off the airplane, and this is a. Uh, 
where the where the barrack and still barracks on. They said, Well, we don't have any. And I said, What do we sleep? Uh, you go out that gate over there. <laughs> you see a stand lot <laughs> and they'll take it downtown to a hotel. And so about five of us got together, we're gonna stay together, you know. <laughs> sure. Go be in a hotel in the country like that. Never know what's gonna happen. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and we all had weapons, so <coughs> we kept our weapons close to us. Sure. That first night in the hotel was something. And then the next night, <laughs> it was still, you know, on edge. Sure. Yeah. And how long were you in Saigon for? Let's see, a year. What type of planes did you all work with over there? Well, at that time, I was taking care of the AOCP boat, that's aircraft and commission. Yeah. But then South Second Air Division, I had a room of bulls about as long as from here to there. Yeah. And what and was your rank by that time? That was when I started. Yeah. And how many folks did you have working in, under you? Folks. At that time, about 15. So they must have, you're now a veteran of two wars, <laughs> you're going into a third. They must have had a great deal of respect or at least had a lot of questions for you I'm sure oh, yeah. and when you found yourself going back to Vietnam was it like exciting or were you like how do I find uh, myself this, back this to this a third like war this life is going over to the war right. that's what it was yeah we're going to Korea and now yeah. with you being there that early were you there when they had to leave the Hanoi Hotel Hanoi Hotel or, or when we had to Leave Saigon and then end up coming back. That must have been after, after I left. Then. When did you leave uh, Vietnam? Let's see. I'm trying to think. You were there about a year, right? Yeah, at Vietnam, yeah. 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 And then um, you moved back to Ohio after that? And the next move was back to Lockburn Air Force Base in Ohio. Sure. And uh oh, North Dakota. Oh, back to North Dakota. At that time, yeah, North Dakota. Some of those trips. Uh, sure. <laughs> I'm, am I'm just <laughs> amazed that you have such clarity and and, and all these things, and, and we appreciate it. Um. So you go back to North Dakota, and then you end up working in Ohio again for a while, right? Right. I came back to Ohio after North Dakota. And how long were you in Ohio before you finally got back to Florida? Well, <coughs> about a year, I guess. And then you get back? No. You see, I went to work for the state of Ohio. Sure. After I retired from the Air Force. And what, what year did you retire from the Air Force? Uh, I have to look on my certificate. Oh, know. so it was the <laughs> 70s or 60s? <laughs> I don't know, 70s, I guess. Yeah, 70s, okay. So I was 60. Yeah, th there's no quiz here. We're just get, getting a, a timeline together. What did you end up doing for the state of Ohio? What did I do? Yeah. I had the quality control division for the state of Ohio. Sure. Uh, we wrote contracts for the entire state for all license that was used by all state agencies, including uh, 22 state hospitals, nine prisons, and two reformatory schools. And now when you're back in civilian life, uh, were you able to reconnect with some of your peers from the Tuskegee Airmen or from Korea or from Vietnam? Oh, the only one I met was Boss McCreary, and he's sure. the one that uh, got me the job. And I had read in our local paper that you all had a, a group that you kept track of with each other. Um, were they all over the country? Yeah, they're scattered now all over the country. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then you finally get back to Florida around when? Let's see, what year did I come back to Florida? Was it 70s still or the 80s? No, 80s. In the 80s. What a journey it must have felt like, right? <laughs> you had come literally around the world and yeah. back to Florida again. It was a mobile train outfit. We had the testaments all over the country, completely around the globe. And uh, how many children did you ultimately have with your wife? I had three all together, but two boys died childhood. And, and just had the daughter 
<laughs> and eventually, over the course of the 80s and 90s, the, I know there was a lot of re-examination of you know, some of these groups like the Tuskegee Airmen and eventually the Brigadiers about just the amazing role in history where uh, you all were trailblazers, pioneers, uh, and do you feel that the success of the Tuskegee Airmen and, and then afterwards was one of the big factors of integration and, and the prominence of many African Americans in the military after that? Well, I think they made a dent in the society. Sure. And so, uh, oh, continue. It's been a long. It was a long journey. Sure. I'm, to to I'm just. I'm a youngster. So it, it matters. Sure. <laughs> now you eventually hear that the Tuskegee Airmen are getting the Medal of Honor. How did you hear about that, and and what happened next? Oh, when we got congressional gold medal? Yes. Well, they've been working on it for some time. Sure. You hear things from time to time. You know, all at once it happened. And you got, did you hear it in the news? Did you get a letter? Yeah, I have, have the medal. I'll just have to sit in the dining room. And, and, and what did you feel when you, ha first of all, did they send it to you or did you go oh, get no, it in I the ceremony? No, uh, President Bush gave it to us. So, so you no. went to the White House then? No. And what was it like at the White House? Oh, I was stunned. <laughs> and what were you feeling at that time when you get this this well, prestigious medal? Well, I, I felt grateful. I said, what the, I said to myself, it took me a long time. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Many years. Yeah. And then you ultimately now were retired here to Maitland, Florida, wow. right by your childhood uh, home in Winter Park. And uh, when you look back on this long career and and all the places you've been and you come back to Florida, what, how, what's your reflection on that? Like, how would you describe your journey? Well, the first time that's World War II when I came home, I got off the train, you know. And uh, a guy by the name of Roy is, he was one of the cruisers on there. And uh, see, when I was coming out of New York and got down to Virginia, uh, the police came through and he made a statement that uh, all your boys move forward. You know. And see, I knew some guys had weapons. <laughs> sure. <laughs> when he made that statement, I could hear the clicks, you know. And see, a lot of them had old coats on them. And uh, there's a few guys in there, but it blew that guy away, you know. Sure. <laughs> and, and after he walked through, uh, the conductor, no, the poor walked through first and said, oh, you boys must follow. And nobody moved. Sure. I heard the click from the, the roll coast. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, when we got down further down in Virginia, then the police came aboard. They don't have to come through, walk through. Sure. And he just looked and walked on out. Sure. I think he got the message. Then. Sure. Well, you all, <laughs> you, our, sitting, you all had served our country, defended us <laughs> in World War II, and I would imagine you're not going to come back here <laughs> and be. So you think things weren't the same afterwards? There's like a well, emboldened feeling that things had to change, right? Yeah. We see the bunch of guys on there had been. Infantry, yeah. I'm Air Force, and with yeah. a lot of infantry and people out there. And one guy said, You know what? I've been killing white folks for the last four years. There's one more making a difference. <laughs> right. And, and, <laughs> and they were, and, yeah. and, and they, you know, they had earned their place in history. Yeah, I didn't want anything to happen because I want to get home. So sure. I knew if it had been an incident, I'd be hopeful. Of Cushion, you know, all this other stuff. So you had that homecoming. <laughs> what was it like for the last one when you finally get down here for good? Oh, oh outstanding! I had uh, incidentally when you put in for retirement, you'd be surprised to know you get letters and pictures of houses all over. 
Sure. And, and I got a phone call. What are you going to retire? And I said, Central Florida. I got all kinds of pictures from Central Florida. Sure. Uh, down below, um, I ran below the center. That was all swamp when I was growing up. Oh, so yeah. Part of our district now. What it looks like now. <laughs> Well, it must have been great. You, so you picked a house in Maitland eventually, or yeah, and it was awesome. Yeah, but I saw I was too. I'm showing quite a few. Yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful home, and well, thank you. I just want to take a moment, Mr. Hall, to just thank you for this opportunity to be able to interview you about your experience, your journey, your clarity, your role in history to make this country what it is today. We're just so very grateful for your contributions, your sacrifices. No. and your service to our country. Uh, you are, even though you'll probably not accept me saying it, a real true American hero, and we're so very grateful for mm, what you've done for both folks that you grew up with and so many generations mm. after you. Mm. Thank you so much, Mr. Hall. Well, thank you. Thank you. See that pad well done? <laughs> you want to take a look at it? Sure. We're, we'll, we'll cut the interview.